pleased to have Josh Malnick presenting and talking about his work a little bit with Lori Christenberg. This was a case where I was incredibly lucky to have a very well-informed friend who uh, introduced me, uh, introduced Josh and I in the course of pulling together the installation. And uh, um, maybe just to give the, uh, locate both of them, Lori is director of LAX Art, has been faculty at SciArc, and is in general, uh, I think, one of really the most curatorial presidents the city is, uh, is lucky, lucky enough to have in its midst. Uh, her space on La Cienega is a phenomenal place to see an incredible array of work in so many media that multimedia doesn't really do it justice at this point. Um, uh, but truly a kind of phenomenon, that, uh, I think, within the, within the kind of spectrum of contemporary art possibilities. And uh, Josh Melnick uh, is a, that I, we met on Friday, and it's, it was really an incredible pleasure. Lori suggested Josh uh, get involved with this, or actually asked him, and he was kind enough, actually really sight unseen, to to uh, agree to um, be involved with with uh, um, blow, with blow by blow, and to show some of the work he's been he's been uh, working with over the last over the last couple of years. And in fact, there is both a project installed on the four screens, and and well, actually, I think some work related to that that will uh, I think give it some context. Uh, and, is, and also, I think the set the chair of the chair, which is also, uh, he'll also be talking about a little bit here. Um, and I'm just trying to, Josh, these are the portraits. How do you refer to this? This series is called the Train. The Eight. The yeah. Eight. Yeah. The Eight Train. Um, so with that, uh, I think I'll turn it over to you guys. You know, um, you know, this is a very interesting experiment, I think, um, you know, for all of us, because it's sort of like blind date curating, <laughs> and I'm a kind of uh, mediator, and um, it's interesting, uh, really, to see Josh's work in this context, particularly because Josh and I are just getting to know each other, and I'm just getting to know his work, but really when, um, you know, this context was brought to us, I really understood that we had to locate a young artist who would be open and flexible enough to, um, you know, take on this experimental proposition, especially when working um, with moving image, the specificity of viewing conditions, of equipment, like there's a, a knowing your background and where you come from, and get just getting to know that the, there's um, you know expectations having to do with technology and um, legibility of the moving image that I think is at the heart of, of your project. And so to see um, you open enough to show your work in, a, in an experimental viewing context, I think, is is really interesting and. Um, but perhaps you could talk about this specific project, because I know this um, this project, the H Train, was produced recently for a solo exhibition um, at Art in General in New York, and um, we came together kind of to discuss, um, you know, how to navigate uh, a solo show in um, a nonprofit <laughs> and those particular conditions, and so that's how we came. Um, you know, together to discuss how to deal with those particular politics in, in a recession, <laughs> and <laughs> how to have a successful solo show in, in a difficult time. Um, but perhaps you could talk about the genesis of the project, um, the relationship between, uh, you know, your interest in photography and moving image, how you approach your subjects, um, you know, the kind of specific conditions originally, in New York, and how you think that has kind of transmutated in this context? Okay, there are a lot of questions. But yeah, as Lori said, this was a piece that was first made for Art in General, which is a nonprofit space. It was a commissioned project, um, and the project has 
many, many portraits of people in the subway that I shot, both the people who I found and met and also actors. And just to give you a little bit of context of what you're seeing, um, basically I, I retrofitted a scientific research camera to shoot with these people, and it's, what you're seeing is less than two seconds of real time with someone. So, um, <clears throat> so in these less than two seconds, I would shoot it, and when it's expanded, each portrait ends up being around four minutes long. Um, conceptually, the project has never been about portraiture. It was sort of using this lens of portraiture in a way this very stereotypical lens of shooting people on the subway and all the ideas of public space versus private space, what it means to look on a subway to sort of ask larger questions for me about perception. Um, I guess on a very basic level, what became interesting to me about these cameras is that they see what the human eye cannot see. Um, you don't get to see it all on these screens because um, originally, I should say, when these were projected, they're projected high def and they're projected in a very, very dark gallery so that you're aware that there are other screens around, but you can only see one image at a time. And you're able to focus on details that you wouldn't normally be able to see. Sometimes you'll see flashing lights in the frames. Those are the gases inside of fluorescent tubes turning on and off. But you're also able to see things like micro-expressions, ways in which human gesture takes on meaning that your eye, that our bodies normally perceive, but we don't are consciously aware of. Um, further from that, the project is also about, I would say sort of, to get back to the photography and cinema, a really looking at this zone between photography and cinema to ask questions about how we see the world. Um, it became interesting to me when you think about a photograph, often a photograph is a moment that is caught in the past. You can see the subject of the photograph as other, or someone separate from yourself. And it's, it's this thing. Often with cinema, you have a narrative, you have emotion, you have all this thing in the frame. So I started to sort of explore with this technique, something that was sculptural, that played with time, and that was somewhere between cinema and photography. Because I realized that something started to happen when I looked at people in this way. And this is after many series of tests where if you approach something initially as if it were a still photograph, and you might say something, you sort of project a certain meaning up to it and have a certain assumption. And then as you realize that that, that still photograph is moving, and in fact is not only moving, but is moving from one side of the face to another side of the person's face, if you practice focused and attuned looking in a dark place and you're watching it, you can sort of become aware of the way we psychologically project meaning on things. So at first, this person looks mean, but then you realize they don't look mean because their eyes are somehow slinted in between a blink that might take a minute to unfold. So it became these sort of micro gestures that I was starting to looking to explore and um, really thinking about the way in which a portrait itself could disappear. Is there a way where looking at another person we can realize our own process of looking at our stuff and how we create meaning? So that's sort of a little bit of a conceptual backstory. Um, technically, to answer your question, my background is sort of a, a long, looping background that started in, in visual art, working in sculpture and installation, and sort of went off into filmmaking. Um, I've always been interested in public art and the ways that, that art can actually interact with, with the public. And to me, after the art school, I started to think that mainstream media might be, you know, either that or architecture I was thinking about. These, these are the things that excited me, you know, were really the ways to actually communicate with people. Um, and, uh, and so I made com commercials, I made music videos, and I think that art has to compete with media. So it's very important to me that even in a nonprofit, like a challenge world, that the images have certain fidelity, certain quality that can compete with the music video commercial, can be seductive on some level and draw people in to engage in certain conversations. Um, there were other questions you asked, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how do you approach the subject? Oh, yeah. The subjects, um, as I started to say, the subjects were a combination of real people who were found and actors who I hired. And again, there became another sort of thing I was testing in this project, which was really about authenticity and humanism. That can you tell the difference when someone's acting? Is there a certain way in which this is beyond acting when you see people this frame rate? Is there a certain way in which can you act a gesture? Can you act a blink? Um, and so I started to do these tests combining real people and actors. Um, 
for me, the project really came to life. Most of the actors were cut out, I'll tell you that. And the project really came to life um, as I approached people in some way. Normally what I would say is I would walk up to them, tell them what I was doing. Everyone knew that they were being filmed, they had to give me their permission. And I would just explain a little bit about the project. And, um, you know, as you've seen some of my other work, a lot of what I'm interested in is interpersonal connection. A lot of my, my things that I study and look at are psychology, neuroscience, the way human beings connect and talk. So it became a really interesting process for me to go up to strangers in some way and ask them to participate, simply because, you know, obviously those are barriers that aren't really crossed. And, um, and this is sort of, you know, what sort of happens is that the camera itself can only take one shot every 10 minutes because of the technical, whatever the amount of capabilities that it takes. So I would often spend time where I would walk up to someone and I would say, here's the content, you participate, and I'd say, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm taking the A to this train, and that train to that train. It's so cool, I can do you. So I'd actually spend this long time just sort of sitting, sometimes in silence, sometimes in talking to these strangers, wandering around the city, and then when the time would come to shoot, we would shoot, and it became actually for me a really nice parallel, really sort of unexpected surprise. And could you speak at all, if it's relevant, how architecture or the city more largely informs some of your thinking or some of your Well, I mean, obviously there's so much discourse in architecture about public versus private space, right? And, and the subway is one of the quintessential things about modernism, you know, the train is like, it brings me to today as one of those first spaces along with elevators and hotel lobbies, I guess, where people all of a sudden didn't acknowledge one another. And um, so I think that was very important because my project is largely about, you know, in a way there's this question of what happens when we're given the excuse to look deep at someone. On the subway, everybody looks at other people. You, and I know that I find when I ride the subway, and I don't know how many of you, has everyone here always been based in Los Angeles, or has anyone not been in the New York City subways? Here? Okay. So I mean, I think that there's this desire to look at other people. Everyone does it. But as soon as one sees you looking, you have to look away. Um, and um, there became something interesting where these images, because they're captured in less than two seconds, they really are the last. They are the time that you look at someone before they can actually get to the point. But it gets extended into such a way where you're going to stare at them and indulge in that stare and sort of see what other space to open up for that I was thinking, Josh, after we spoke on Friday about this project, that it, 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 the, the, locate, the locating of this work really stuck with me in an odd way over the weekend. And I was thinking that in an odd way, the subway system of New York is all is, uh, in one sense, this kind of extruded black box condition. You're underground, that it's a space of artific artificial light. And in particular, I, I, I gave some thought to, um, we, we, we were talking as we were sorting out the installation about the, about the kind of, the way temporality and the contemplative seem to, you know, seem almost a, this sort of interesting default condition of the methodology. But I was also thinking that there's an odd, an odd uh, and I feel like, I, I, I like to imagine there's a broader point about your work in this kind of rhyme between uh, psychology and science, that there, there, there are ways in which it sort of, it sort of takes the, the, the literal effects of a mode of representation and then allows a whole spectrum of implication or emotional legibility to kind of play out of that very objective technique. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that the subway itself sets up some interesting characters for that, and in part that in many cases we have you know, these kind of upward directed gazes. And I realized later that you sit in the subway looking at the map exactly. and seeing where you're going because you can't look forward. The most, you know, the only like the only option you have for the you know, for seeing the future on the subway is to is to re is to kind of focus on that destination. You know? yeah. But it just uh, I don't know. In any case, it, like the, the, it just seemed like both the mechanics and poetics of that decision to work in that space were really really well. Definitely. I mean, it always, the, the project for me, it always had to take place on the subway, you know, um, and, uh, yeah, but that was really good point. I think I was thinking about all that stuff. As far as the people's views, you know, it's exactly what you're talking about, because if you were going straight up on the subway, you might have to do something else. Um, I also would have done something else. And of course, I was thinking about all the crap, and all the stuff, 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 but for me, the project is always about looking at people and people. So you have to make eye contact. And it's one of the ways in which seeing people is very different than 
see it in the gallery where the eyes are actually, each frame is digitally enhanced so that the sharpest thing in every frame are the people's. Um, and, uh, and, and so the load of the dress is it lower as well? Yes, yeah. it's lower, so you're not at uh, you're not scale. And also in the gallery, you're at a very prescribed way you know, to see it in terms of the distance. I figured out that the school team distance from it. So, yeah. Oh wow. That would be almost it's almost impossible to have yeah. sort of against the wall. Well, I mean scale is always a problem. Playing this tension between, you know, you don't want to be too wide and you want that to be cinematic and also to be too small and be photographic. It had to be somewhere in between. But you know, when I first started doing the project, I of course shot people doing things other than you know, whether it was yawning or reading the paper, and immediately cut those all out because like I said, the project is about even the eye contact. You need to look at people looking so that you can go through the process of projection that you're talking about with the movement of the Chinese When you look at someone doing anything in slow motion, all of a sudden it becomes about the gesture. It comes to looking at you and you want this. You might, you know, it becomes a low level of piece all of a sudden. You're looking at this gesture. Yeah, I was actually going to ask, could you talk a little bit more about how, uh, how, how that differential, how you establish a differential between the project and say, I, mean, I, I think they could be more different conceptually. Um, they use similar capital technologies, but I think that, um, you know, uh, this is sort of trying to stay away from the metrics and trying to stay away from the gesture. Yeah. Um, I think that's the consequence of the imagination of the project. I always yeah. realized that I went on my mind, so. Oh, can you, can you just hear us? Are we lost in our little world? It's hard to, very hard to do. One question that I have maybe for both of you, from the perspective of the architect and the perspective of the artist, in light of the fact that we're kind of enveloped in this experimental architecture um, for projected video, is perhaps you both could speak about some of the functions and dysfunctions of the white cube and the black box from both of your perspectives. And maybe I'll try to be brief, and then Josh, I'd love, I think maybe I'd love to also see where you set up a much more emphatic and kind of calibrated black box condition. But there was definitely the sense in our installation that we were trying to actually operate between the white cube and the black box. And, you know, I think we've had a few discussions in the space. I think a lot of our installation had to do with some anxieties I had about architects operating in gallery space and a, and a concern that frankly, architects often don't kind of calibrate their aren't forthright about how they're vested in those spaces. And so our basic vocabulary of, 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 of white had a little bit to do with echoing the walls in and an understanding that this is sort of the medium of our discipline. We work, we, you know, in this setting, we operate in white walls and though we, we've, we've kind of attenuated and thinned out and actually tried to lighten that the, the kind of ramifications of that authority in architectural space, I think it's still tied up in that. But I think, frankly, almost all of my interest, uh, uh, not, not all of it, but the, the point of departure from my interest in work in new media had to do with a further dissolution of that white wall into the space of the screen. And to a certain degree, and I think this actually is where it sets up what I hope has been kind of a fruitful tension with the artists that have worked here is in this notion of the screen and not as a not as a, a white not as the the white wall of the gallery distilled into a single rectangle in a black box, but actually this intermediate the, you know this intermediate zone that could you know that could hold or transfer an energy in different ways. For sure, and if you're I mean, you're an installation artist, that you've really made made something that really really changes the. <laughs> and both of you, in light of this experiment, have spoken to the fact of maybe like by um, you know, being, taking part in this process that potentially something site specific for these screens and this installation would be something to consider if this is to be addressed. So from both, I mean, that was both yeah, of your I should responses. Say, I feel like the, the biggest, it's an incredible act of faith and kindness, I think, on the 
part of all the artists, but I, I've said this a few times to Josh, especially where he was, and you know, it says quite a bit actually about Lori, about Lori, your seriousness and credibility that this was able to this, that this was able to happen. But it, this, I, I really do think this whole inst this whole installation was conceived in a certain sense, kind of as backwards to the work exhibited in. And I, I still stand by my presumption that most artists working in the media either develop content and then a situation for a sense of that content, or as we've discussed with Josh, a much more integrated notion of both as a project was involved. It's certainly not a situation like this where so many of the parameters are set and then they're then they're kind of made made sense of to the degree they can. And this had this has a little bit of a, a longer rationale in terms of our studios work on the film school. But in any case, I, it's a huge act of kindness, I think, to be done. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm always interested in um, different ways of perceiving things. And this, it seemed like an interesting experiment. You and it, and, and, I was like that. And, it, <laughs> and it is that. And you know, if art can do anything, it can ask questions that we can pose as non-professionals in a certain sense, and sort of make these little experiments, have these little conversations, and see what happens. And you know, that's really exciting. Um, maybe should I show how the piece was, was originally yeah. shown so yeah. people can get a And then it might help like um, seeing other work as well so people yeah. can kind yeah. of get a I sense sure. of your larger craft. We might move over so we can um, I'm, I'm okay with these, these quite, quite quickly just so you guys can get a sense of how um, different it was. I mean, my background is in installation. So I think a lot. I never make pieces without thinking about how they're going to be shown. For this piece in particular, because it's about setting up this meditative process of looking, um, the installation was particularly important. And I actually work with um, 3D designers and, and um, you know, and CAD basically to design the space to try and figure out a way where a viewer could walk into the space, understand that there were screens all around, but not actually be able to see more than one at a time. Um, so something is always in the way. Some of the screens are on the wall, and one of them is suspended off the wall. The screen on the foreground left is, is across the wall. And there were these benches sort of posed at, a, at particular distances where people could sit down. So the idea was sort of for people to understand there were a lot around, and then, what's going on with this here? Sorry. and um, be able to sit down and look at them. The gallery is completely dark. The only light is from the bounce light from the projectors. And there's the illusion of total silence. Actually, in the gallery, what you hear is I mic the, the fan, the sound of the, the fan and the projectors. There's a very, very um, almost imperceptible hum. There's this idea where it sounds like silence, even though it's not silence. Just to even out the space and really settle people in. Um, there are a lot of studies. Um, about empathy and connection is relation to fear. And one thing that most people fear, feel on the subway and public places is some sort of sense of fear. There's others around us. And that's the exact, neurologically, the exact opposite thing that needs to happen for you to actually be able to respond empathetically or intuitively to another person. So the whole idea of the installation was to create this very, very dark space, so dark that you almost can't even see other people around you. And you can sit on these benches and watch the pieces unfold. And like I said, for me, the optimal way to see them is singularly and watching them from beginning to end so that you see or perceive this camera moving from one side of the face to another. And you sort of are able to um, attune to that process of looking and what changes as, as people's gestures change as you move around in the space. Um, so that's sort of the original thing. And, you're, and the next project that you're working on um, so the project that I'm working on now currently is called Share Work, and um, <coughs> I'm trying to think the best way to describe this. A lot of my work has been using the sort of lens or the guise of portraiture to ask other questions about looking in general, how we look at other people, how we create intimacy in non-intimate spaces, and to get back to the whole white cube problem of the gallery, which I also have certain problems with as well, and I'm very interested in the way that art can actually interact with people 
who don't necessarily have to know anything about art to engage with it and can sort of pop up in surprising and subtle places. So recently my work's been moving much more into a social practice and having public development. Um, so sort of the thing that happened as a nice surprise with strangers shooting them, these people on the subway, has sort of been expanded. Here in this project, we are giving, you know, an excuse to this one else. And this new project called Chair Work, it's about having two people look at one another. So what I do, this is on 68th Street. It's the what used to be the Reebok store. And what I basically do in this project is I take over um, abandoned retail spaces and I set up essentially a pop-up film set. Uh, with two gray seamless backdrops, a lot of lights, and um, enough that it entices people to come in. People, when they're walking from the street, can see all the lights, they can see the commotion of the film set. Again, it's sort of creating a theatrical or architectural space to make sort of seem like it's going on. And there are PAs around, and people are invited to come in and sit for a portrait of an artist. And these are people, you know, in the 60s and Manhattan. Most of them, they would never go to museums and are doing anything. And anyway, the exercise, the piece is called Share Work. It takes its name from Fritz Perls, um, which was the founder of the Schnell Psychology. And he did a lot of work in the 60s that um, you know, was then appropriated, you know, not in the psychological schools, also by certain cults at least. And, um, you know, well, I think that Schnell is as well, really, you know, interested in it. But anyway, this, basically, in Fritz Perls' mind, a chair work was anything where two chairs were set across one another. And there were all these different chair works that he made up. Most of them had to do with psychodramas where you would sit in one chair and you would be your mom. <laughs> and you would sit in another chair and you would be someone else. And you sort of bounce back and forth between these chairs and you sort of, you know, get healed. But there's another exercise that he did where you simply sit across from someone else and you look into their eyes. And that's what this exercise is. So basically, people are invited in off the street. They don't know each other. They're asked to sit across from each other and look into each other's eyes. And the instructions are very simple. I basically say, you know, listen, this is not a um, staring competition. It's not you can't blink. This is a moment. Take three minutes out of your life and see what it feels like to look at another person and see what it feels like in turn to be looked at. Because these things never happen on the street. And, um, and go from there. So basically, we shoot all different kinds of people. Um, the cameras are captured with these very high definition cameras that are turned on their side, so their orientation is a bit more photographic. And they're shot, you can see the two cameras um, over the shoulder of, of each person. They're shot in identical over the shoulder angles, which you'll see a little bit later what that means. But if anyone is, you know, you're familiar with film conversations, an over the shoulder shot is how conversation is normally covered in a movie. Um, here's some more images. Um, so to give you a sense of the, of the framing, the two cameras, they're far enough back, you can see the tripod sort of in the distance, and these are little monitors I used to frame so that the frames were identical. And on the right, you can see a plasma screen that I also use for framing, because at the end of the day, these are shown in life-size plasma screens. Um, let's see, that sort of gives a sense of what they'd be shown like in, in real life. Um, And does this project have a destination where it will be exhibited? As of now, not yet. The whole idea with this, and I'm actually applying for creative capital grants and things like that, but the whole idea is to go across the country and to set up these pop-up sets all over the place and shoot a number of uh, events and collect this huge database of portraits. Um, the, um, the, the project really has, has two lives. In my mind, it's, it's about in my, in my mind, it's, it, it's about, oh, that's me with long hair. It, <laughs> um, it's about this twofold thing. One is that how can we create situations outside of the gallery where people can come together and, and experience? The one thing I'll say about this exercise is that, and I recommend you all go home and try it with someone you don't know, or we can you know, do it as the end of our little, our little thing here now. But it's a really powerful thing, and everyone has their own reactions to it. Some people get, just can't stop laughing. Some people zone out and disconnect. Some people say, oh my god, I never realized how beautiful someone else's eyes are. Some people feel vulnerable, some people feel powerful. All these very things from childhood really come up in this exercise, simply from looking into other people's eyes. Um, 
And it became interesting to me as a, just a sort of totally public art practice to bring people together, let, them have, let this happen. They wouldn't normally do that walking across the street on 60th Street, and then sort of send them out into the world. And whatever happens, whatever sort of subtle shifts as a result of that little engagement that art created, let that happen. And it's my belief that, that actually that will help to create a more peaceful world going forward. And because of your interest in, in a public or, or I mean, in terms of this kind of process and the way that you're engaging with individuals, um, do you see this um, kind of culminating in a project that's actually inserted in the public domain also, or is that not necessarily important? I think so. I mean, the idea with these is that they would have a twofold life, and I'm going to show you guys actually after this a brief sample of one of them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so the idea is that you have this event, people go out and do their thing, but it also can be shown in a gallery. Um, not simply so that it can be bought and sold as a pretty object, but because there's something that happens when you look at people here that you can, in this sort of way of this exercise, that you can never see as a participant. It has a second life. And that's something that is, um, and you'll see this when you see it live, it's the fact that human beings mirror each other. And we simply can't not. If one person on the left blinks, the other on the right will blink. If someone smiles, they're all smile. If someone leans, they're all lean. And there's this sort of little dance that happens, um, which unconsciously we're all doing all day in, in our world. So. And um, to me, that became really fascinating. So the idea was, it's sort of, I mean, these could be displayed in public places, such as lobbies, or they don't have to be in, in a gallery, but I kind of became interested in making the documentation a set of pieces of stuff. So that these could be a public piece, but they could also have this sort of other more traditional component but one that wasn't simply stills from a video or something with the more traditional ways in which art performances become art objects in the marketplace. Um, uh, last slide. Me with long hair talking to people again. Um, I think I'm wearing the same sweater from the next picture. Either that or they were more scared. Of me. Um, and then afterwards, we, we would film everyone. That's my partner, Angie. And we would film everyone after they had this experience. Because the craziest thing is that after someone sits in silence across from someone they don't know for three minutes, all they want to do is talk to one another. And there were so many things that come out. And it really, some of the people would stand around for 20 minutes. These are people who had appointments to go to. And they would just need to talk to And it would be everything from oh my god, like, you were totally thinking this about me and that about me, to, you know, and, and it was really, really kind of amazing and beautiful experience that, that would come So anyway, that, that's chair work. Um, and uh, let me show you a little video. Um, these are two women who know each other. I'm going to rewind a little bit. We won't, we won't watch the, the whole thing, but um, very, very low, low res, low res version. <coughs>
So in a way, the project's very simple, in that sense. but it is, it, it's sort of an extension of this, which is really just asking the question of what kind of spaces are we up, why do we are giving permission to look at one another, and um, seeing sort of where that, that comes, and where that goes, whether it's, you know, <coughs> several characters in the same event, the same moment. And somebody said the best way to understand Einstein is to understand what is an event. I'm sorry, I said What is an event? Mm -hmm. uh, it appears to me when dealing with psychology and staring, you get down to a moment and you capture that moment with photography. Uh, what do you want to leave with us in your art, in your presentation? How do you want us to feel? What do you want us to grasp? Um, is it personal? Is it, uh, do you have a theory, a aesthetic theory? Um, I think that, first of all, I want to apologize. Just hearing how difficult it is to hear your question, I can only imagine how little of what we're saying you guys are getting. Right. So, um, I might have answered this question before, but you just didn't come, come across. I, I, said I might have talked to a little bit of what you're asking about, but it might have not have been, been clear enough for the volume. But I guess that, that in a nutshell, what I'm, what I'm interested in... Repetition is one of the more knowledge of modernism. But I guess what, if there's anything that I want people to walk away with in a nutshell, is to think about what it means to look at someone else, and what it means to look at something deeply. It's really about the process of looking, to me, and to sort of try to cultivate scenarios where we can think about and ask questions about our perception and how we look at the world. Ultimately, I think that the key to solving, I mean, to me, this work is very political, it has a very political and social agenda, but the way I'm choosing to address it is to sort of to, to step back and make it much more simple, to get really, really back to the base, to the building blocks, so that audiences can experience the work on a series of levels. Um, the work's really influenced by meditation, which if you guys haven't noticed already or couldn't, didn't think that, I mean, it's like, it's a practice that I have in my life, and it's something that I think about a lot in terms of these works. When you meditate, you think about attention, you focus on very specific things. And through the process of cultivating attention, um, I don't know, I don't want to get into a whole thing about meditation, but <coughs> that's basically what, what I think that I think that there's a lot of once you call something very small into question and you realize that the way we see the world is not actually the way the world actually is, I think that, that it opens up a whole other host of questions and dialogues that can be potentially very powerful and interesting. And um, that's sort of where I'm coming from with this work. Are there any other questions for Josh? Um, what stage do you plan on during this project next? And do you think that people in different cities react different to looking at each other? Just based on the way like cities are designed and people interact in their daily lives with each other? Well, that, that's something that I definitely want to experiment <coughs> with, and I'm totally curious about. Um, I'll tell you this, that the way African American men, for example, inter interrelate with each other from my limited experience is really, really different than white men. 
um, there's so much homophobia from what I saw, at least in New York, that it became a lot harder for the African Americans to settle in. Women in general seem to have a little bit easier time with it. There's so many things that, that you don't want to like go broad, and that's why my goal is to like literally shoot it everywhere. And I don't, I don't think that there's, there's sort of no way in my mind this exercise can fail. Like small town where everybody knows each other versus like a huge city where no one else does. It's simply about getting into the chair and seeing what happens. Because basically, you know, it's what I was sort of saying to Joe about this contraption that I agreed to participate in without seeing it, is that, you know, the, the, the beauty about, about art is that we can work as non-professionals and create active change in the world. So it's like, I'm not a psychologist, but I feel like this is powerful. And I really like playing with that, of being able to like work with people psychologically in even only like a minimal way. Um, so I don't know where I'm gonna go next. It really depends on what institutions I can get money from and how, what kind of support I can get. And um, when you said project budget for something like that, is um, that a food question? No, not, not at all. I mean, this is the, the project budget for all of these things. Would really, there's the actual budget of what it would cost, and there's the budget of uh, what I do it for, based on like cheating the system. So like I direct commercials, but each one of these are sort of made through the channels of commercials so that I can do them very cheaply. This chair work shoot um, was done on you know cameras that cost close to a million dollars and with lighting that you know if you were to do this, try to do a set like this, it would probably cost you about a hundred thousand dollars a day to film it. But I was able to shoot for two days for two thousand um, dollars. You know, we're saying with this project, like the post production alone in this project would have been about like two hundred thousand dollars but I was able to get it for free because the company that I work with for commercials. Uh, so again, that's, that's also a lot of ways I've been thinking about my work and my practice is I sort of try to navigate these two very different worlds of commercial media and art and sort of trying to take from there and put to here. I wonder, I mean, that seems almost like, uh, I, and I feel like maybe there's, I, I don't know actually if there's any generational divide. Maybe, it, maybe it's always been that way, but I'm struck in the process of doing this and with talk, you know, talking with other people both. I think it's true actually in the, in the field of innovative architecture at this point, but maybe across the across visual, visual arts and culture. And so much of the really innovative work seems to happen at the margins of, you have, you have, you have so many really talented people who lead double or triple lives within a certain market for marketable visual culture and then a more intense, usually for them a more intense focus and, and personal body of work that often you know often involves getting a couple extra days use out of cameras that yeah. may not have been beastie boys cameras on right <laughs> but i was wondering i was wondering josh and maybe uh, i if there are more i don't want to grab it if there is another there's one i'm sure i'm very fascinated by this piece up on the projectors um and uh interest I, what I'm really fascinated about is like how you know what Joe said about people uh, in New York subway kind of in a black box and they're like but still to to be just waiting to, to be you know to be transported to uh, different locations and uh, you know people are really still and like things are moving in the background and uh, so there is notion of like time and speed and velocity uh, of the uh, of you know of the moment. And uh, I kind of like started thinking about like if he could, like you know normally when you conceive the movement it's the object you know uh, is moving like when you're walking through the space and background kind of like stays still but here's a you know the object that's actually moving through the space and it's kind of like this kind of like inverse uh, you know situation seems to be really fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, I mean that play between space and time when I talk about perception is definitely something that was there. On the subway, the things that are moving the fastest, I mean you can see the flashing lights. What you're seeing is you're seeing gases inside the tubes turning on and off. You're not actually seeing, because our eyes see light as constant, but actually light is always moving, especially fluorescent light. Um, so yes, of course the motion of the train became a really important time signifier to include. And also, there's um, another uh, notion of like you know three-dimensionality. Like you're moving the camera really slow, and 
you know, such like it's like still motion, but like the background changes, so it gives you, you know, really interesting three dimensionality to to the whole film. It's just fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sure we should wrap up, but I, I I feel I just want to ask you one one question that's basically a formal one. As I look at the images, I was thinking as you were speaking that maybe we brought up viola viola earlier, but I really in terms of the kind of the strategy of your work, it's probably closer. Last week, uh, um, a lot of the, some of the discussion headed towards Dan Moran's work, and there was major retrospect on his work. Bennett was on that panel and been really involved. And actually, the setup is closer to Graham. And I was thinking as you were speaking, there's sort of, in Viola, there's sort of emotions without people, and in Graham, there are people without emotions. And these, these, these elaborate, generally symmetrical relationships of mirroring and projection and, and video videography that play out in the play out in these in these fields that are, that are in many respects you've in some ways you've miniaturized and mobilized a very Grammian <coughs> field you know field of, yeah. of work here but I was wondering in particular about one or, and I feel like this touch this touches on it that in most of the compositions of the of the eight train of the eight train videos, and especially in this one, one thing you don't do the portrait photographer. I was told just recently, portrait photographers tend to bias the head of the subject high in high in frame. Mm -hmm. That the un the the uninitiated center the face and people who are out to you know and that it's that it's a professional convention that you actually buck really really precisely. <laughs> And in many of these cases, the the uh, in many cases, the head and eyes are are dead center in the frame. And similarly here, I was just wondering about how that how that question of I feel like there's actually a real an incredible graphic refinement to the way you work that makes it legible in some of the ways you're interested in, but probably goes a little bit un un, un you know unrecognized or undiscussed. Well, thank thank you for picking it up. <laughs> No, seriously, because it, it's definitely there, and it's something that everything is, is very thought out, and there's a real reason, like you said, why things are dead center, so that your eye goes there, and concentration goes there. Um, and yeah, it's like, I feel very, well, I feel like my interest lies much more with people like Dan Graham or Robert Irwin, or people who are interested in this exploration of looking at yourself, um, you know, looking at yourself, looking, seeing yourself, seeing it. And um, that's why the eyes always have to be front and center, because ultimately it is about that. It's looking at people looking at them. What does that mean? How is it, you know, how is it projection? Sorry. Uh, the Polaroid camera. Hmm? The Polaroid yeah. camera. Uh, the movie Barry Lyndon uh, and Marshall McLuhan, who said the medium is the message. I'm wondering the impact of your approach to art in the light of, uh, at one time the Polaroid was like a throwaway picture. Mm -hmm. And now, in the 21st century, it looked at as a work of art. And I think the psychology of what you're dealing with, and perhaps the existential consideration uh, I'm wondering about the effect of what you're doing. Are you creating an experience, a response to psychology? Are you trying to provoke the internal existence of one's soul? Where, where does Barry Lyndon come in? It's one of my favorite movies, by the way. Well, it's sort of like a Polaroid shot by a candlelight. Well, well, I mean, Barry, Barry Lyndon, so the, the other thing that happened in, in Barry Lyndon, right, is that Stanley Kubrick had lenses which were made specifically at that time to be able to see by candlelight. They were the fastest lenses ever made. Normally, you couldn't see, film couldn't expose by candlelight, and Kubrick had these lenses made. So all of a sudden, cinematically, you could see something that film couldn't pick up before. Just like, you know, with these, with these cameras, part of what excites me about them is that they see things that not only your eye couldn't see, but traditional celluloid can't see either, because the amount of light required to shoot at these frame rates, if, if you were shooting on film, for example, in the subway at these frame rates, and you turn the camera on for the two seconds it took to shoot this, the amount of light that would be needed would not only be impossible, but it would give the subject a sunburn. 
So here you have this military technology that basically can see in the dark. And that's very exciting. Now, it might be different five years from now, as we know from all this stuff. Technology is always outdated. Um, but so I think that's another, another free socialization that I have to your, to your thing about Barry Linden. Um, maybe you could rephrase the question again about, about psychology, because I wasn't exactly clear about that. Well, um, CNIG gave into nano art through psychology. You want to deal with what's in the dark, what's not ordinary seen. And I think that's good, and that's in the line with what modern research is doing today. But I'm, I'm wondering and showing and, and bringing this essence out that you want to portray. Uh, you, you look at it and say, it's interesting, but I wouldn't want to take it home with me and put them on a wall. Or you say, well, how would this affect society? You're pointing out to something society's not aware of, or you think you're covering new ground, or do you think it's mundane? Well, it seems like there's an interest in like the performative nature of the work. There's an interest in like a psychosocial kind of investigation, um, as well as highly formal art historical, a highly kind of aesthetic practice and concerns. So it seems like there are multiple kind of intersecting priorities in your practice. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think he seems to be um, interested in social practice as you discuss, and also, um, you know, you are a formalist and an athlete. <laughs> so these seem to be um, well, well. I think what you're doing is very contemporary. They're on target. I raise that question not to be uh, an anathesis, but uh, <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> and we appreciate it. Well, I, wonder, I wonder if maybe, when you were talking about taking this across the country, the chair work, I was thinking about this works so instantly and easily as an urban project where people can come in and volunteer. But I was wondering, as, as you were asking the question, if like what, what Josh is trying to do is slow interactions down uh, the way that a Polaroid does. Um, like slows the way people interact down. I wonder if like, you take it to a rural center where you have to actually go out and solicit people, how that might change chair work. Yeah, well that was sort of her question as well that she right. brought up, which I thought, and I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, but the rhythm, the, the, before you said, the rhythm there is so much slower already. You know, where you have people, you know, it's not exactly so you're just passing people on 68th Street all the time. You actually have people who might actually take the time and look at each other a little more often at a slower pace. Yeah, but I also think that we live in this multimedia, frenetic, internet-based world. Even if you're in a rural thing, even if you're a farmer, I mean, maybe that's different and maybe I don't know, but I feel like simply the, the speed at which life goes and the way in which sort of psychological interactions have been so fundamentally shaped by modernity that you don't necessarily have to be in a city to, to experience that. Um, Right, there's something there. there, like to, you know, interacting in the kind of suburban slowness. <laughs> and this too, I mean, it, it, Douglas Gordon famously slowed slowed a, a John Ford film down to what was it, you know, something like a hundredth of its rate of rate of progression. And the whole issue of 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 the kind of cowboy's stoicism and the and the kind of or the already still close up becoming unbearably still, yeah. I think becomes kind of an interesting question as you move out of you know, what you presume would be a kind of dynamic urban. Yeah. And, and his work is, is I love his work and I love you know twenty four hour psycho is obviously a piece I was thinking about a lot in relation to this stuff. Um, and there is this sort of different thing that happens the difference between you know, reproducing optically free frames that exist and that your eye can see and seeing things that are almost unbearably slow, which you know are there but your eye can't see. And I don't know if it's, if it's a, I'm making that clear, but to me there became this very subtle but rapid difference between duplication and presentation. It still becomes abstract. The same way with the, like the normal screen that's what I also look at it's like in a way that they couldn't be more different than this. Um, 
But formally, someone might look at them very quickly and, and draw a card. Do you want to I'd love to leave the last word to you on that. I would just, um, you know, maybe want to just put forward uh, the question to both of you, just in light of, um, you know, where we're situated, and maybe since you've gone through this process with multiple artists, um, you know, your intentions with this project has um, uh, kind of staging multiple artist projects in this um, in this projection space in this installation. Has it altered? your conception of media's relationship to architecture? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I'll be, again, I'll try to be quick and leave Josh a, clo Josh a closing word, but I, I was thinking as you were asking that on a really basic level, this project has always been vectoral to me. It's been about mapping vectors that moves through space and taking projection as mechanics of vectors. And I feel like at this point, honestly, the most important vectors to me over the last few weeks have been interpersonal, have been about engaging with people who have come to, and it's, I feel like it was a, a kind of suspicion I had going into it, the one with I, one which I had very, very little firsthand experience with. It's really, it's the nice thing about putting together a project that you feel works out, you know, that you feel works out, period, is that you end up kind of, you end up, you end up flowing into other people's lives and getting a sense for how other people work. And in Josh's case, in, in this case, it's been the most uh, kind of clear cut because I, I, I have, there have been friends and friends of friends whose work I've seen in greater nuance or depth or clarity, but this has been kind of lock, stock, and barrel. And interesting to me, in terms of, and I realize now that portraiture is a loaded and tricky term for discussing your work, but I have to say, personally, I have a bias, honestly, against art that is preoccupied with portraying people. Like, I actually, and I think this is endemic among architects. I'm more interested in space than people, and it's, a, you know, I, I'm vaguely ashamed to say that. I think there's a kind of built-in kind of anti-humanism to, to that to a certain degree, but as an architect, I spend a lot more time thinking about art that has to do with dimensionality, uh, you know, spatial parameters than with the capturing of human emotion or possibility. And it's honestly, though I think your work cuts both ways, it's been a really wonderful kind of, I, I feel like this particular pass has been a cleansing one. I think it's been, been great to participate. I don't think I could, could wrap it up any better than that. Other than to say from a friend of a friend of a friend <laughs> to many friends. <laughs> We're all friends of friends now. So, um, And I would say that if you want any more information on chair work or the exercise, come talk to me and I can explain it a little bit. And it is a nice dark room. There are a lot of chairs here. And it's a perfect opportunity to, to, to sit down across from someone and, and test it out. Thank you so much.